this all set up, go live over there on Facebook, and get live over here on Instagram. All right. <clears throat> Just give me a second to just set up. All right, we good there, we good there, and we good there. All right, I'm going to play uh, while I get things going, wait and give it a couple minutes. Get people to come in. I'm going to play a new track from the brother set, Typhoon. this up, get this cranking. All right. This is itching ears. Set it number after the first hour. After that, you have to come over to YouTube. We are live on Facebook. So, a of blessings to everybody on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. All right. Just gonna let this track finish out, and then we're gonna go ahead and get into it. Itching ears by Set Typhoon. I'm gonna reach out to this brother and get him back on the next uh, hip hop and occult show, which is the first Friday night, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and that is on Primordial Chaos Facebook. All right. So that was the brother Set Typhoon itching ears, and we're gonna talk to him a little bit more. We had him on um, the first show. Uh, but we're going to get him back on and talk to him a little bit uh, further, all right? And that's the first Friday uh, of every month, and that is on Primordial Chaos, streaming on Instagram, too. Uh, but it is, you need to um, go over, if you actually want to be a part of it and interact with the guests, you need to go over to the Primordial Chaos Facebook page. All right, that's the first Friday of every month. Hip Hop and the Cult Show. I think what we're going to touch on the next show is uh, maybe make a top 10 MC list. Not sure, but uh, we're going to decide that in the next couple of days or two. I'm actually going to get with the brother Tizer, get his feedback, see what he's thinking. Um, 
and then go from there. All right, so a couple quick announcements before I begin, and I'm going to get right into it. Um, again, a reminder for those who are members on the Patreon page. What's going on here? I don't know why this damn thing stopped. I'm cutting up. Hold on one sec. Thing. I don't know if this thing is going on. Give me one sec. All right, hold on, I'm having issues here. Let me come out of there and try again. Give me one sec. See if I can get on here. I'm having little issues on the Instagram. All right, there we go. I think it's connected now. All right, so we are we are live uh, on Instagram. All right, um, so yeah, those that are members of the uh, Patreon page, we do have the Ten Balau ritual tomorrow, three p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, if you are a tier three, four, five member, all you have to do is go to the original post, and you automatically uh, have access to the ritual. Okay, so that's tomorrow, 3 o'clock, Eastern Standard Time. That's only for people who are members of the Primordial Chaos uh, Patreon page. If you have not seen the page, I encourage you to check it out. It's in the description box of the video. Patreon.com forward slash Beniti. That's Patreon.com forward slash B-A-N-I-T-I. Um. I will be posting soon, probably sometime this week, uh, the next uh, upcoming class that you'll be able to sign up for, which is open to everybody, um, separate from the Patreon. Anybody will have uh, the ability to participate in that. I'll be putting that up in the next day or two, more than likely. Um, so look for that. Uh, also, if you are interested in a spiritual consultation or a reading, uh, just to be clear, the three types of readings that I do offer. Uh, are readings with the Cl Lucifer and the Clopathic demons. Uh, you could do a reading with Santa Muerte, the Holy Death, and the Spirits of the Dead. Or you can do a shadow reading, again, which, ex as I've said the last several weeks, which exclusively deals with shadow work and shadow work only. Uh, it can be intense, as I said before, personal. Um, encouraged, uh, we used to deal with, discuss, and do the work that comes up in those readings is beneficial for your personal growth. But again, you are not forced um, uh, or, or pushed into doing anything you don't want to do. I make that clear. That's not how I work. That's not how I operate. Um, but highly recommended and suggested. So understand that uh, when you do inquire or reach out to do a shadow reading. Know, know what it's going to focus on and, and uh, be prepared to work with and deal with what comes with that, okay? Just want to make that clear. Uh, if you're interested in any of those readings or a consultation, and I just had somebody yesterday uh, that booked two hours, and you can use a consultation. It's different from a reading. I just want to make that clear. There's a difference between sometimes people confuse them as being one and the same thing. They are not. Um, a spiritual consultation can just, it's, it's just what the word is, a consultation. Whatever you want to discuss, talk about, you got questions about anything on this path, if you need advice on anything, whatever topic you want to discuss, that's completely up to you. You can utilize that time uh, however you see beneficial for you. That's the difference between a consultation or a spiritual reading. So when we're working and we're doing a spiritual reading, we're using systems of divination to communicate with the spirits. Very important we understand that and there is a, a difference. So if you're interested in any of them, just shoot me an email. Again, it's in the description box, khnum19 at gmail.com. If you forget, again, it's in the description box of all the videos. Um, and just uh, in the email, please include the days and times you are available and the time zone you live in so we can make a uh, or set a day and time that works for you. And uh, we can get that going. All right. Um. The, I know some people have continued to inquire just to update and uh, kind of put it out there. Uh, some have reached out again, inquiring and asking about the journey of the Black Addict Conference 3, which was uh, 
or is slated for the last October, last month in October. Uh, still, uh, we haven't made an official decision. People asking, are we still going to do that live and in person? Um, I couldn't tell you that yet. If I were to give you an answer now, more than likely, no, we would probably still do it virtual unless something drastically changes. Um, so either way, we will do it. Uh, we have an alternative method to do it. And I stress that. Um, but exactly how we're going to do it, we will make an official decision on that in a couple of weeks, probably the next three to four weeks. Um, and then we'll go from there. I know people have sent me emails, asked about it. Uh, it keeps coming up. Um, but that's you know, we, we will make an official decision on that in the next couple of weeks um, and see how we're going to proceed forward with that. Um, and once we you know have that mapped out, uh, I'll share that information. You'll know where to sign up and how we're going to go about doing that. All right. So it will happen one way or the other. We're just not sure how that's going to happen yet. Um, we're just going to play it out for several more weeks and see, see kind of where we're at from there and then go from there. All right. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Hit the like button. The more likes uh, the videos get, the more they expand out on the YouTube platform. And again, as I mentioned before, remember when you subscribe to the channel, to get notifications, not only do you have to hit the notification bell, and I found this out a few weeks back and I shared it with everybody. Uh, and this is any YouTube channel you subscribe to, not just mine. When you hit the uh, notification bell after you subscribe to the channel, uh, when you hit the bell, it gives you options. Do you want all notifications, some, et cetera? If you do not hit all, you will not get all notifications when lives or new videos post. Uh, how they feed that to your feed I, I couldn't really tell you i don't know how it works uh because i found out over the last year or so people say they subscribe to the channel but they don't get all the notifications well make sure you you check all notifications after you hit the notification bell all right so that pretty much covers uh the announcements all right if you're here for the first time this is an occult left-hand path channel all right I got to stress that sometimes because sometimes we get some ignoramuses once in a while that are religious and spooky and they show up. And it seems like they always show up when there's any title that's connected to religion or the Bible, such as the last show I did. We had, a, we had one or two that came in, but super spooky and religious. I just want to make this clear. You're not going to be able to come in here and enforce your ideology on myself or anybody else. So what we basically do is just X you off the channel. We don't, it's not what this is about. We're not going to let um, people disrupt. Um, so it's not a religious channel. So understand what you're tuning into, what you're watching. If it's not what you're looking for, then find a channel or a place that's going to cater to whatever it is you're looking for. All right. As I said before, this channel is just about putting information out. I don't expect you to agree with everything that I discuss. It's not my job, whether you love it, like it, or hate it. I couldn't really care because once I turn the camera off, it's a memory to me. So it's not about that. It's about you taking the information and you utilizing it the best way you see fit. Whether you agree with it, disagree with it, that's the whole point, to incite uh that awareness to, to even create the discussion to whether to, if you can start thinking on a multitude of levels, whether again, whether you agree with it or not, that's the point to incite some type of discussion or awareness. And that's something you have to wrestle with uh, in your own free time. I'm not really interested uh, in that part of it. Okay. So just get to make, make sure we're clear on what it is we do here. OK, we're not trying to recruit nobody. I just want to make that. There's no agenda here. We're not trying to get you to sign up for anything. I, that's not what this is about. I just want to make that clear. Um, there are things such as the Patreon page. Yes, to sign up for. When I say sign up for, there's nothing you're, you're joining in the sense where you're obligated to follow any rules or regulations. That's not. I get emails. How do I join? And they don't join what? There's nothing to join. Uh, you can subscribe to the Patreon channel. As I said on there, I do have a mentorship program. It's just what it is. What is a mentor? It's somebody that mentors or guides you in, in a particular area. In this case, the cult left-hand path. If you are 
interested in about seriously taking your level of learning to the next level, then that's for you. It's work, as I've said many times before. Um, there's rituals, there's assignments, uh, there, there, there's going to be uh, detailed time, effort, and energy you're going to have to put into the program. Um, and that's why I keep saying, if you're not able to commit, don't waste your time and don't waste my time. Um, so if you want to know about what it is I do or what it is you can be a part of outside of the channel, that's where you want to go, Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash Beniti. There's several tiers on there. You can, I'm sure you can find one that fits to your liking or what you're looking for. And that is where I do private classes, rituals, and again, the Red Magus Mentorship Program for those who are interested in taking it up to that serious level or degree, all right? So what I wanna kinda get into, you see the title, Ancient Egypt and the, the various planes of existence. So in all levels of spirituality, whether it's, I don't care what it is, if it's ancient Egypt, metaphysics, alchemy, the occult, we always talk about these planes. What are they? We always talk about the astral realm. What is that? Right? I, I see a lot of stuff over the years as if uh, the astral realm is the tell-all, be-all destination of finality. And that's not the case. That, they can't, that couldn't be the furthest thing from the truth. Now, ancient Egypt, right, which in my opinion, I've said many times over the years, is not talked about enough for how deep, heavy, and intense it goes into dark magic, dark alchemy, and dark sorcery. Really, ancient Egypt is the root and foundation of a lot of these occult sciences, black magic, and spiritual practices that we talk about. Um, but as we know, over the many years, there's been this concentrated effort to, to focus on a lot of this watered down religious new age stuff, right? Where everything with Egypt is presented, you know, with this, the mother goddess, uh, the ancestors, which that's fine, but it goes way beyond deeper than that. Uh, as I've spoken many times over the years, I think a lot of people who practice comedic, comedic studies are very aesthetic in their understanding and they almost approach it as a religion like Christianity, Islam, or Judaism, where I also see that, you know, they're guilty of doing this in Ifa slash Santeria, whatever you want to call it, where there's still that worship factor, right? Where we're still praying, worshiping, groveling in front of things, um, which is confirmation, regardless of how you present it, which is confirmation, you still think there are some inferior forces outside of yourself that you are susceptible to regardless of how you package it and sell it. Well, that's against what we do on this path. That's against what we stand for on this path. That's actually totally against the whole foundation and purpose of this path. We talk about a lot about apotheosis, self-deification, self-master, right? Which is very Luciferian in nature. Egyptian magic or Egyptian Heka is very Luciferian in nature because the main foundation and principle of being a Luciferian is to master yourself, is the concept of apotheosis, self-deification, is to understand the fact that you are the governor, the ruler, the god of your universe. You must understand you build and destroy every day in your subjective conscious. Everything that has been in store there from the moment you were birthed into your universe are the worlds and the realms you create in your mind. Those are the only things that are a reality. Um, anything outside of that uh, that you accept and bring in, and we have done that over the years, are what we refer to as systems of indoctrination. Things that can't really be confirmed, proven, or a reality uh, you know, for you. That's how you have to put that into perspective. So we all, I'm sure a majority of us who grew up here in the Western Hemisphere, we all were probably forced into, in some shape, form, or fashion, monotheism. I don't care if it's Islam, Christianity, or Judaism. It's just a system that has been put upon us for thousands, for the last several thousand years, right? Um, we go outside of that box. So when we get into ancient Egypt, and the coming forth by day, the Book of Gates, the pyramid text, Especially the coming forth by day is basically a spell book. It's basically a book of magic and sorcery. The ancient Egyptians were the most skilled 
black magicians and sorcerers than any other culture on the planet. And it's not talked about enough, the worship aspect. So we tap into the magical aspect of ancient Egypt, deities such as Set, Sekhmet. Um, we understand the elements and how they all connect when we look at Shu, Tefana, Geb, Ra, right? We know that there's a science behind the foundation of the elementals, how they correspond to the micro and the macrocosm and how that connects to us as magicians and adepts because a skilled magician knows how to connect with the forces of nature or creation, the elements, um, and knows how to work. We talked one time about the various aspects of energy, right? Um, it's important to understand everything that we're talking about here is energy. It's just the magician's job to master and understand is the vibration and frequency of those energies. When is the correct time to utilize them? How to tap into them? When to understand them? This is why we don't deal with banishing rituals, right? That's for systems of lesser magic. All right. That's for systems of, say, high magic, earth magic. Um, when you're banishing some form of energy, again, it's confirmation that there's something external that you fear that can harm you. A real black magician never operates on that level. He or she. Um, we what we do is we sanctify um, our circle, our space to lock all of that primordial chaotic energy. in. We don't try to eliminate or banish any of it. Because we know as the masters and the controllers of it, we facilitate that primordial chaotic energy. That chaos does not consume us, devour us, or control us. Whereas other systems teach you that there is some external energy. Like people say, I do banishing rituals because I'm trying to remove the negative energy. And then I ask the question, "What? describe to me in your words what negative energy is. In essence, it's just perception. That perception is based on your study, what you determine um, that's good or bad, okay? It's a personal perspective and an objective on things, right? We have to understand that. So when you're banishing something that you term in your personal realm as negative, then you, what you are essentially saying is you feel that can be harmful to you. And then the next, next question is why? Why do you have that understanding? Why have you grasped that reality? Because you can't be a um, practicing sorcerer, magician, or adept and feel like these demonic forces, spirits, or energies can control you. Then what would even be the point of setting out on this path doing work? It wouldn't make any sense at all. Okay? We have to understand that. It's hard to grasp that over time because, again, the overtones of religious indoctrination are stamped in the subconscious mind. So people still whether they're conscious of it or not, still have an aesthetic approach to spirituality, even the occult, even the left-hand path, okay? Um, so we need to consider these things, all right? I will go through some material, uh, okay, just to uh, address infernal blessings and greetings to all. I appreciate everybody with the greetings. I will come back to the chat uh, as soon as I get through the material. I'll look at your comments, your questions. Um, and any, uh, maybe you have something you want to add to the conversation, feel free. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there. We have to get to the point, especially with everything that is going on right now. We see what's going on in the world. We see, we see how things are shaping up. You better get to know yourself now more than ever, right? As it says in Alchemy and Mysticism, in the Temple of Heliopolis, know thyself and thou shalt know the gods. I don't think we focus on that simple statement that's been around for many years in mysticism and hermetic alchemy. Know thyself and thou shalt know the gods. So the first thing I ask people, oh, I work with this spirit. I work with that God. I work with that. But do you know yourself? Have you done the essential shadow work to give you the real true insight to what these deities represent within your psyche? Most people, if they were real with themselves, they'd have to say no. Okay. Shadow work is an important essential, as I've said many times before, the last several years and, and all the videos. You can't get around it. You can't escape it. If you truly want to master yourself, that's the root. That's the foundation. So when you know yourself, then you can know Shu. Then you can know Set. Then you can know Asset. Then you can know Shango or by whatever spirit deity and whatever pantheon. Then you can start knowing Abaddon. 
then you know how Samaya you know how to work with the various masks of Lucifer. You can't do this if you don't know yourself. Because within the psyche of knowing the self, um, it's going to help you understand, one, not just you, but your relationship uh, to these deities. Okay? So I want to go through the planes of existence. I'm taking a section. Uh, this is a book on vampirism. I'm not going to really be focusing just on the vampirism aspect. This is a great book, the Ascetian Bible. Um, it's uh, written by Louis Marquez. He's putting out a couple of books. Uh, as I've said many times before, outside of just the spiritual path of vampirism, there's a lot of information in here, in my opinion, that's very neutral and can apply to the path, uh, the left-hand path and the occult in general, not just vampirism. Um, again, I make this clear. Uh, the spiritual aspect that I connect with vampirism is a comedic or ancient Egyptian connection. And the feeding aspects is more vibrational and energy. Um, I don't really get into the literal feeding when it talks about dealing with uh, blood offerings and all that other stuff. That's personal. That's your path. That's your path. Um, but sometimes people don't understand, as I've said many times before over the years, the full extent and power of vampirism. It's a very highly evolved mental and spiritual path. It's not for everybody. It takes a lot of skill, discipline, and practice because you're really tapping into the powers of your mind. And the absorption aspect, the giving and exchanging of energies, which can be termed spiritually in vampirism as feeding, um, it takes a lot of skill and discipline. All right. So though I won't be really focusing on that a little bit, it will come up here and there. I want to focus on the planes of existence. And I think this book really breaks it down. I'm going to dispel the myths on, again, some think the astral realm or obtaining travel there is the tell-all be-all. That's only the doorway or the gateway to a multitude of realms, and we're going to talk about that. All right, so I'm going to go through this material. Now we'll go back to the chat. When I'm done, I will take your questions, your comments, and uh, we'll go from there, okay? So just be patient with me. All right, planes of existence. The ability to wander freely between the subtle planes has been known throughout the centuries. An elder vampire is a creature detached from the physical, a being of energy that roams the astral in a powerful way and interacts with these other planes, almost as if it was his native realm. In these other planes of existence, the vampire has the power to shapeshift, assuming whatever form he wishes it. It can be a wild animal or simply another creature with a human-like appearance. That icon in the astral plane is completely under his conscious control and bound to his will and power. I want to stop there. That's why I said a minute ago, as a magician, an adept, you control the spirit. So we're talking about shape-shifting on the astral realm. Whatever, some also talk about creating servitor spirits, very similar. You always command and control. Your consciousness is projecting the thought forms and the power into which you manifest in whatever form um you're you're giving it shape as it said he used an example here if you're if it's shape shift into a creature an animal or some other being your consciousness is giving it life and form so you're always commanding and in control and that you're always the one sending that energy out for a specific purpose or intent all right we want to make sure we're clear on that all right being the astral and the etheric plane i'm going to talk about the etheric plane which is important that goes beyond the astral, right? And that's going to be the one of the last things we touch on. This is where the vampire is the lord and master. More than in the physical realm of mortals, uh, the Ascetians have long learned and developed the abilities to experience the different planes of existence, manipulate them, and wield them at their will. There's that word manipulate, manipulation, right? On the surface, we know that in everyday life is to be something negative. Right, to be manipulative, right? That's not a good thing. Well, we're not talking about that kind. We're talking about manipulating the energies, right? Because in essence, that's what a magician does. It manipulates the energies for their beneficial favor. So look at it in that regard. You're constantly manipulating energy. How do you do that? By having a thorough understanding of what it is you're working with and dealing with. And then being able to come up with the necessary information and formula to carry out how to manipulate that energy. That's what real magic is. It starts part of that process. I always talk about 
you will have to reprogram the subconscious mind from all the indoctrination that we've been exposed to. That's a form of manipulating it or changing it. Um, part of that deprogram process and reprogramming the subconscious mind is one of the steps that you will have to do to do that. And that connects to some of the root aspects of shadow work, because in essence, you're, un, you're, you're deprogram all the indoctrination, all the traumas, all the things you've been exposed to that are, that are impacting you on whatever level it may be, you will have to deal with that. So you learn how, how the science and, and the personal formula you need to carry that out, all right? All right, then it goes on to say, uh, the mastery of the, those planes and learning how they interact is of considerable importance in the development of the vampire, equipping him with tools and techniques for other forms of magical work, energy manipulation, personal accomplishment, and development. Although astral is the most common year, word used when referring to the subtle realms, it is in fact, here's the main, listen to this, it is in fact on, one of, it is only one of the main layers composing the planes of existence. So the astral realm is one of many. I bring that up because as I said many times over the years, and I think I was talking about it recently, a week or two ago, um, again, there's this misconception that, oh, I've obtained the ability to astral travel. That's it. I'm there. Got the doorway. That's the reality. That's the entrance way, the gateway, the doorway. When we talk about the clip path, right, and working with the clipothic bands and entering through the citra acra, when you go into the abyss, the void of the darkness, that's the doorway or the gateway that I'm talking about. Once you enter the abyss or the void or that pure state of darkness and utter silence, I like to call it because it's a spiritual silence, is the best way I can, de I can describe it. Now you're in a realm where there's no boundaries. There's no parameters. There's no limitations. You can't, you can't put a beginning and an end on it. You can't even classify it by anything that's defined person, place, or thing, which is three-dimensional. We are all three-dimensional beings when we are conscious in the physical realm. So most of the things we perceive, our mind has to register it where we can identify a three-dimensional person, place, or thing. So we're talking about a place and realms that vibrate outside of that existence. This is what we're talking about. So I can only do the best with human and mortal words to describe it. That's the only way I can. I have to take tangibles that you can get a visual and a concept in your mind. Experiencing it is a whole other different thing. Because experiencing it is to confirm it through the experience. It's a whole different level. That I can't convey in the words, and nobody can. So we need to at least get the general understanding. The only thing I can do is give you a general understanding to at least get you to the doorway of understanding that. But it's going to be up to you to take the initiative to discipline yourself through your spiritual and ritual work to go through that door. All right? All right? Although astral is the most common word used when referring to the subtle realms, notice it says subtle realms, okay? In fact, it is only one of the main layers composing the planes of existence. There are, five main, there are five main planes of existence in the subtle realm, each being highly complex and composed of other more secondary structures. Each of the five realms is very different from the other and obeys to different metaphysical rules because of the whole construct of reality from which it is made. They are not only different in the way they are formed, but also in the way they will react to your own presence and how energy behaves in that specific plane. That's because everybody's going to interact with them based on their experience. What is the second principle of Tehuti and the Hermetic Principles? The doctrine of correspondence. The first principle, all is mental, mental is all, the universe is mental. Well, the second principle, how you perceive the first one is going to dictate how you correspond and understand that first principle. That's what this is talking about. So your perspective and your perception, if you are very aesthetic in your approach to that understanding, then you're going to have more of an external approach. If you understand that this power resides within the deep, dark abyss of your subconscious mind, that the power of the deities and the gods rely in the psyche and they just need to be activated and you manifest them in whatever form they take, whatever visual you see, all is mental, mental is all, the universe is mental. You create, even when the deities manifest to you in a spiritual experience, a meditation, a ritual, 
Your subconscious mind has shaped and formed and given them life based on everything you ingested about that deity, every image you ever took in, every letter word that you ever read about that deity. Your, your subconscious mind stores it like a computer. It's no different going on a computer and searching for a file. You find the file because it's that process. Understand you've been building and destroying and creating and building and destroying and creating. You do it constantly, 24-7. You did it from the moment you were birthed into this world physically. You do it day and night while you're awake consciously and while you are asleep traveling the astral realm or the dream realm, whatever you want to call it, the dream worlds, right? There's always a build and destroy going on simultaneously within. The deities, the grimoires, the spiritual paths were trying to show this to the initiates. They were trying to give them the understanding of the realization of this. So they were trying to describe what takes place internally, but created a whole mythology if somebody could relate to it on a very simplistic external level. The problem where it gets a little bit thrown off and confused, unfortunately, religions were birthed out of these concepts, where now we have men who came along and literally created these things as man worship, external worship, worshiping things outside of ourselves. And it came with this God and devil concept, good and bad. There's a ruler over everything. There's messengers or angels that come to give messages and guidance to the prophets. And then the prophets give guidance to the people or the sheeple, as I like to say. And really it's just a system of control, manipulation, uh, and to keep you in a state of fear, okay? So we gotta start understanding this so we can think outside of this, right? Uh, then it goes on to say, I ran out of meatballs. Okay. Where the hell did I leave Okay, yeah. So that's, that's the first one, the uh, intro to the planes of existence. Let's talk about the, the ones I want to run through, the physical, the inner, the astral, and then end with the ether. So just give me a, a few minutes to get through those, uh, and then I'm going to stop there, right? The physical, lower plane is called the physical. And although it is formed also from a subtle reality where energy flows and can be interacted with, it shares its space with the material, physical realm. It is the realm where the body resides and all the physical matter, but it is also full of energy. That while on this plane, it behaves differently and obeys to its rules. It is also the most easily accessible plane of existence and where most of the direct spells, incantations and applications of direct energy manipulation are used. We call this lesser black magic. Majority of the work you will do will be black magic, right? Um, I'll explain as we go along. When, when we have to deal with something of a more intense nature or a greater magnitude after we have exhausted all options, then we go into something called GBM, greater black magic. We'll, we'll discuss that when need be, all right? Uh, then it goes on to say, for example, when a construct is made and attached to a door, it is really crafted and present in the physical realm of the subtle planes. However, it is common to create a linked clone on the inner plane as well, so that the structure does not dissipate so easily. There are some who even go further and create another clone in the astral, although it is not that common. Many people confuse the astral plane when they are just interacting with the actual subtle plane. And I think this is where a lot of people get misled. Some think they've obtained the astral realm or astral travel, but they've actually just obtained what the book just described right here. Okay. We need to understand that. Right. Um, and this is the physical realm or their own inner plane of thought. Right. Notice it keeps going back to the inner self, the inner plane. Right. As I said before, there is no above, there is no below, there is no within, there is no without, there's just within. That's what the Baphomet really represents. So I don't care what all that other shit that's out there, right? The, the, the religious alchemy aspect of it, see what, what takes place in the heavens takes place on the earth. Yeah, but that, that, deeper than that. What comes from within is also without. Yes, what's reflecting on the inside, but in essence, it's all from within. These planes... I want to make this clear. Don't look at these planes aesthetically in layers, right? 
because a lot of systems teach it where it's, we're back to religion, looking up where there's layers and there are layers on top of each other. That's that heaven concept. concept. Um, and it's still a form of religion. Remember, these planes are interwoven around you. That's why I wanted to do this class today, because I've been talking a lot about that lately. And I wanted to shed some clarity on it. Right. I want to shed some darkness or into light. These are planes that are interwoven around you and based on the vibrational frequency we are vibrating at determines what we have the ability to connect. I've always said years ago, Matrix movies were trying to show that. When the pineal is not active, activated and it's calcified, you cannot penetrate it to see it because you create a layer of density that disconnects you from access to all of those realms. We do that a multitude of levels, bad information, the wrong information, not being in control of the emotions, uh, physical aspects, health is connected to all of those things play a factor into it. Not, it's, you gotta have a thorough understanding of all of them. And we all have issues in those areas that we need to work on, all of us. Nobody is obsolete from it, okay? So this is important to understand. That's the physical, the inner. The inner plane is our own realm and kingdom. This is important. We are definitive rules of that realm and it is crafted out of our energy, thought, and bound to our own true will. That's why I say you're the builder, the creator, the destroyer simultaneously. It is also the realm of unconscious mind where our secrets and inner wanderings are kept. It is a wide space built out of our vital energy alone and full of constructs created by our own mind from our dreams, wishes, thoughts, and fears. Dreams, wishes, thoughts, and fears. As I said, Everything you've exposed yourself to are the elements that shape and build this inner realm, right? It is a safe place to roam, even though it might not seem like it, right? But all creatures found there are just faces and aspects of ourselves. I try to tell people that you have a dream. I had a dream. I had a nightmare. I saw this creature, this morbid, uh, demonic uh, looking thing. That was another aspect of yourself. You just didn't realize it. It was showing you something that was going on internally. We think it's something outside of us, right? Because people think it, they make it more deeper than it is. I saw, I saw this, this monster in my dream, blah, 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 blah. That was another manifestation of yourself. It was showing you something. Um, and that's how the subconscious mind will, will communicate to you in the inner realm. It will manifest your deepest internal fears sometimes. Sometimes aspects you created, wishes, it said thoughts, dreams. So it could be any of those factors. And you're seeing it in a certain perspective because there's a reason for it. So don't look at it like it's something that's not connected to you because it is you. So they are faces and aspects of ourselves. That's some good shit, right? That gives a lot of clarity, right? And... They, and they are not sentient beings created by our mind alone. This is also the realm of dreams, where we go, right? When we turn off the conscious mind and simply drift away to the place of dreams and nightmares. It is possible to master this realm and consciously control it, which is how we can shape, feel, and control our own dreams. With proper training, it is possible to gain, to gain complete awareness of the dreams and actually control them. See that? I don't care what it is, you're never in control unless you accept that. So if there's somebody that comes in opposition and that says, no, uh, there, there are beings out there. Like, that's why I don't ever promote that demiurge shit that everybody's been on for years. That the archons can, can, can devour you and, 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 and eat you up and, and eliminate you. Uh, these are beings from the demiurge. I don't accept that bullshit. That's religion, right? The demiurge is another concept of what takes place in the deep, dark abyss of your subconscious mind. It's just telling you there are other issues you need to face, deal with, and overcome there. I don't deal with it on that. I know there's many people out there that teach this literally because now we're back to aesthetic spooky bullshit. I don't believe there's any beings called archons that have the ability, the ability to devour or do any harm to me unless I accept that as my reality. Once you accept something on a personal level, as a reality or a truth, it becomes real to you. That's it. That's where the fine line between subjective and objective comes in. So if somebody comes along in opposition to that, regardless of what side of the coin you're on, you have to understand that. 
So I've got asked that question many times over here. I don't, I don't deal with the demiurge and the archons in that light. I think it's bullshit. I think there's a lot of religious nonsense out there on it. Um, I accept the reality. I am the control of the God of my universe. I build, eliminate, destroy, kill, create, and do what I see fit in my universe and my world that I know is, is beneficial for me. Whatever I don't, I don't even bring it in to my spectrum of existence. It's not a reality. It, it with the inner, right? It's a whole, that's a whole different level. It's, it, it, it takes time for some to get to that understanding because they still feel they're at the control, the bay and mercy of something external. That's just not a reality. All right. All right. Uh, then it goes on to say these techniques lead to the practice of dream walking. That is an effective door to the superior realms of the astral plane, like a key uh, to the outside of ourselves. It is also this inner realm that is a target of occlumency. When a vampire wants to hack into someone's mind for control or mind reading, what he actually does is to an extend an energy link from his third eye. So this, see, people watch vampire movies and they, they, that's the Hollywood version. Remember, that stuff is for entertainment and movies only. There's spiritual explanations. Remember, they took these spiritual sciences and they created mythologies on them, movies, entertainment, Characters like Dracula, et cetera, the list goes on and on. Well, here's how that process works. The real feeding spiritually, here's how it explains it, right? By what he does actually is to extend an energy link from his third eye or shin and pierce it into the victim's third eye, okay? This technique, or third eye or shin and pierce it, the most direct door into the inner realm. The, there are variants of this technique that rely on the secondary shin of the eyes that are also quite effective. Once bypassed the natural defenses of the victim, it is possible to draw information from the inner realm. This is how you're able to read somebody because what does the inner realm represent? All those things I just described. It's the very core existence that makes up any individual that's standing in front of you. This is how a true mystic, spiritual reader or psychic has the skill or the ability to read somebody. And I keep telling people that have done readings and consultations with me over the years. It's your energy that that's presents itself at a reading. It's not the reader that is doing it or tapping into it. They may think that, they may be under that illusion. This is why when, when I'm doing readings, there's certain questions I ask you in the beginning or certain things you do right in the beginning. This is why I prefer to see your physical face uh, in a Zoom video, because all I need to do is look at the Shen, look at the third, and tap into the subtle energy that exists within. And then you get a good reading on what's going on in that person's internal world, right? Inner world, whatever you want to call it. This is the science right here. That's how a real vampire feeds and absorbs energy. They, they, they literally talked about it through years as physically just drinking blood, because the life force of the energy is in everybody's blood. It's the substance of life. It didn't always mean the physical drinking of blood. Later on in later cultures, did a vampire culture exist where they did that? Yes, but that came way later after the fact. When we go back to ancient Egypt, we're talking about subtle forms of feeding and absorbing energy, right? Okay, I just want to make that clear. So we're talking about the actual process now, okay? Once bypassed, okay, the natural defenses of the victim, it is possible to draw information from the inner realm. Reading his mind and thoughts, past and present, even gaining access into the subconscious. Sometimes this technique can be useful in therapy and is enforced by the ascetians in some of those situations. The created link into the inner plane of someone else works both ways, which means just like we can draw information, it is also possible to intentionally send data through it. This is why you have to understand the absorption and getting and receiving of energies. You also can give some out. This is why you have to know. This is why sometimes you can feel drained in certain situations, right? We always say this over here. There's certain people you, you're around, you say, man, every time I'm around them, they drain the shit out of me. That's because they're feeding off this vital life substance. You may not be conscious of it. We all know when we reflect back over the years, we always seem like we've crossed paths. It could be a family member. 
It could be a friend you've been friends with for years, but you always feel like, God damn, every time I'm with them for an extended period of time, they just drain the shit out of me. This, this is why. So remember, there's things that are taking place consciously and subconsciously. So when you're practicing this technique, you need to be aware of that. Don't just go into thinking I'm the shit and not knowing who you're dealing with because they could be on the same level or beyond. And you could be walking into an ambush and you just don't, you know, you don't realize it for the moment. Now, when you develop this skill and technique, you can also sense literally when somebody's trying to send you an attack. Literally, you could be waking up in the middle of the night. It's happened to me several times. Where somebody has got the, your name on their tongue or somebody is at work trying to do something on the astral realm, on a mental and a spiritual level. And that's when you are linked in and connected. You will get up and do what you need to do to counter react that, right? So be careful. It works both ways. When you're doing shit like this, know your target. Know who you're fucking with. Know that you have the capabilities and the power because you might be fucking with somebody that is sending that shit straight back to you and causing more conflict more disruption or, or destruction in your life that just hasn't manifested yet. And it will. Okay. So education is, is the most important part of this. Know the science, right? Um, this is the form of manipulation and control used by those who master the arts of occlumency, a very important, a very potent social tool for people that do not embrace this concept or follow some form of, or follow some form of belief based system. There are times when they try to fundament the possible inaccuracy of the planes of existence defined by the Ascetians with a range of theories based on those loose accounts of personal experiences. And that doesn't always apply in every situation, right? There are many people who relate having seen and experienced a multitude of different realms and planes of existence with a very different structure than the ones we define, where they have faced Countless situations and made breathtaking discoveries when, in fact, whether these realities have been created by their dogma or imagination. The word imagination has root in the word images, right? Your imagination are the images that you manifest, receive, and create based on your perception and your correspondence and relation to the spiritual realms. Okay? So we don't look at some of the etymology of these words. The answers sometimes are simply right there. We just don't catch it. Okay. Um, they simply just exist in one single realm, their very own inner plane, confirming what I just said earlier. It all comes from within. There is no above. There is no below. There is no within and without. There is only within. I don't care if you got to repeat itself to you. If you understand that, you'll be okay. All right. So that, that deals with the inner. The last two I want to get to are the astral and the ethereal. And we'll stop there. Okay. And actually, there's a short section on the divine. Um, and then there's a, I want to show you the ziggurat, the step pyramids, right? The book gives a great diagram of the planes based on the pyramid. And notice the ziggurat is at the top. Look at that. See that? See that right there? That symbol right there? That's why I got that shit right there. Yeah. See that? If you understand what that means, right, then you, you'll, you'll be okay. See that one at the top? That's why I got that one there years ago. Okay? That's the sum, right? These things mean something. These symbols carry energy and constant. I didn't get it because this book came out years after I got it. But that's how I connected to it as it's describing in here. When I saw that there, the first thing I reflected on was that. Uh, but notice how it breaks down there, which we'll get into the physical, the inner, the astral, the spirit realm, the con, right? The ethereal, which we'll get into, the all and I, and then the divine talks about on the top. This is a short section I'll touch on. All right, so let's talk about the astral. Let's finish with this last section here. The astral plane is the first true realm out of ourselves and where the physical cannot reach, right? It is the place where most of the disembodied creatures reside, although this is the place of excellent, excellence for beings that are not currently incarnated. And those who cannot incarnate at all, it is accessible to the incarnated as well. 
The native beings that can be found there are made out of energy. Not having a physical body, they are in their own realm, which is a considerable advantage that should be taken in consideration when interacting with them. The experience and different techniques of astral travel are of common debate and knowledge, right? We could be here all day talking about that. Although what many times is described as an astral travel experience has in fact only been able to project the practitioner to the inner realm. And it said earlier, sometimes when people tap into the aspects of their inner realm, they can confuse that to being this, connecting with the astral realm. And actually it's the inner realm. This is why I, you can usually detect it based on a way a person describes their experience. So we need to understand it. The projection to the outside and into the astral is not as simple and does have some associated dangers, unlike what is commonly defended. You can visually roam by your bedroom or home and still be in the inner realm, since it is all stored in your memory anyway. That's what I was talking about earlier, how the subconscious mind stores all this. It is possible to come in contact with strange bands and come safely back to your consciousness. After all, the creatures found in the inner realms are just our own creations, like it was already explained. However, the beings that can be found are that in the astral are not that easy going and can even behave violently, which given the advantage of being in their native realm can become quite dangerous for the untrained practitioner that would not be able to subdue them. Damn, because if you don't understand the energies you're working with, then you can be manipulated by them, right? Um, Dangers apart, the projection to the astral realm and the roaming throughout its plane are rewarding experiences and a good asset for an unaware vampire. When fully mastered, it can be used for attaining subtle covens and metaphysical gatherings, as well as interacting with other beings incarnated and disembodied. There have even been metaphysical wars battled in these realms of the astral, which although not very common, have proven to be quite potent. Not only vampires and humans are able to jump into this realm, but also other kinds of creatures like the royal servitors that can free, freely roam the astral. Mighty as any other being native to that realm, there are structures built out of energy on the astral plane, most of them non-definitive and in permanent disintegration. Others quite solid and empowered by the mind and will of many. Some of these structures are of major importance. What this is essentially saying is where we talk about the meetings of the minds, you're not only connecting with your mind, this is truly where minds connect. So when it says you're encountering things more so out of grasp of what your mind or intellect has created, this is why I said there's no rule there. Now, when you deal with the clepothic and the beings of the void and darkness, they are manifestations and representations of these concepts. This is why they all symbolize a certain aspect of the clepoth or the gate. This is why when you get through the abyss, then certain deities approach that specifically represent something, whether it's Balao, whether it's Set or Sato, whether it's Lilith or Na'a. They're showing you what these subtle energies, and to be honest, subtle, subtle is incorrect, what these energies actually represent, because now we're dealing with astral energies, right? So again, it confirms what I was saying earlier, there is no parameters here. Don't put borders and the parameters based on your limited understanding of things that are confined to three dimension, person, place, or thing. That's where the dangers can come in. That's where you can get fucked up and confused because you're trying to classify and define because your mind may not be able to register what's taking place. So it's gonna go back to what's comfortable with and trying to put it into perspective based on limited concepts, okay? So this is where the dangers can come in. You need to be conscious and aware of that. That's essentially what this is talking about, right? Um, some of the structures are of major importance and surrounded by very potent enchantment, enchantments, energy shields, and even guarding creatures like the subtle Assetian temples on these realms, not accessible to just anyone. I'm sorry, not accessible to just about anyone. 
The astral plane is also where some of the high magic spells and magic passes through. Many people fail at high magic practices precisely, which really we're talking about greater black magic, not really high magic. They are taken away by their own ego. The spell and energy are only projected to the inner plane. There's a science of why you may not get results, people. I hope you caught that. Let me say that again. Many people fail because the practice at these practices precisely because they are taken by their own ego. So the spell and energy are only projected to the inner plane and not into the astral like it should. In the end, the astral plane is the wide, subtle reality. Even though I said subtle energy earlier, it's really beyond just the subtle energies, but it is the foundation of the subtle energy. And so, so, so easily acceptable, accessible as it might seem, but nevertheless a realm full of energy, life, and mysterious things to discover, learn, and understand, whose mastery is certainly worthwhile. So that's the doorway to the astral realms, to the many planes. That's the astral, right? Now I want to finish this short sections, two very short sections on the ethereal and the divine, right? And then I'll wrap it up and I'll take some, some questions if you got some questions or comments. The ethereal realm is a place very hard to reach. It dwells above the huge astral plane and just below the infinite and unreachable realms of the divine. Most of the beings never actually skim the surface of the ethereal reality, but for those who do, deep knowledge awaits them. It is in this ethereal realm that the Akashic records are stored and maintained. This is where you understand the mystery of life and death and what real destiny is. Right? This is where you understand the mysteries of reincarnation. And I've said for many years, if you have not worked with on some level or obtained connection with that, we would be here all day just having dialogue. There's so many theories on that information. There's so many theories on does reincarnation exist? What is life and death? What happens to the soul and the spirit and the body when at that moment of transition comes? This is all made aware and known on the ethereal realm, okay? What we have to understand is we go, as quantum and metaphysics teaches, we go from a gas to, to a liquid to a solid state. Many great metaphysics and spiritualists have taught this over the years. When we talk about the ethereal realm, we're talking about a realm that is pure energy, right? We're talking about a realm that, again, we talk about in lesser religions uh, as uh, heaven, right? Um, how religions always talk, whether it's a nirvana in other cultures. They always talk about this paradise or euphoria uh, where there's pure beings of light and energy. We, we are a product of that light and energy, right? Not light and energy in a fluffy way. Light and energy. Energy, again, based on understanding the vibrational frequencies of how that energy manifests. Light is the pure intellect that emanates from that energy, right? And this is why you must go into the darkness to be able to tap into it, not in the light. Then there's that artificial light or illumination that the lesser paths teach about. And they indoctrinate it in your mind where you see pictures in religion and Christianity, you know, you see these pictures of a Jesus with the halo around his head, right? It looks very spiritual, you know, and he's got, you've asked why he has the heart with the crown of thorns and then he's got his hand up like this with the heart glowing. That's all that spooky shit to stamp in your mind. When you think of light illumination in these bins, you think of this artificial Jesus character that they smashed into your conscious and then you're right back to man worship and religion worship. So the mind, it just, it's, it's like a, it just, it's like everything you feed to it. That's why I said when you store or, or constantly take an incorrect or bad information, it puts you in a calcified state. It shuts down the pineal gland from vibrating at the right frequency. You will never be able to tap into the ethereal realm if you do not understand how the pineal and the crown chakra works and needs to be activated. Because the crown, even when you're looking on, let's say, the Kabbalistic tree, they talk about keeping the crown, the top, right? That really represents the door to the beginning of, or the openings of the astral realm. Then you say, well, what's the clip off the empty teeth? Well, it's the opposite. It's the other side to the Kabbalistic tree, right? 
It's it's before God said, let there be light. He existed in darkness. That's the point of origin where the primordial chaos and everything manifests. That's the hypothetic. That's the other side of the Kabbalistic tree. The Kabbalistic tree talks about when light was formed out of the darkness. So you're getting before there was the manifestation of things in a solid or human physical beings. It's talking about the beginning stages of primary creation. You need to understand that. You have primary territory and original creation, right? The nation of Islam talked about years, multiple, all created himself in triple stage darkness, right? But they never say what those three, those triple stages are, okay? So you got to ask yourself that. This is important, ethereal, right? Um, then it goes on to say, it is the ethereal realm that the Akashic records are stored to maintain. So it is a place of central importance for anyone deeply interested in past life work. I was talking about that. And self-understanding. However, it is a place that is very complex to find and access. And reserved only for the strong mind with a great and conscious control of the inner will. Again, many people who think they are accessing their past lives are actually just watching impressions produced by the unconscious mind. That's important to understand. Okay, <clears throat> this happens because they are accessing the inner reality and not the two levels above the ethereal plane. This simple detail also explains why so many people find past lives of historical importance or just related with what they expected with a direct parallel with their own expectations. All that is stored and easily accessible in the inner plane. So when they attempt at a regression, they will go directly to these, those records and not really into the Akashic records and the ethereal that are highly complex to manage. So there's a lot of people who do Akashic records readings, right? You hear this, I hear this all for many years, many people. Is it really the Akashic records or are they tapping into what's described here? That's why I'm telling you, there's, 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 there's layers to this shit. It's not really Akashic, it's the impressions as it's described here that, that, that is being left from the ethereal realm, which is not the actual Akashic records itself, okay? Because everybody talks about that, the Akashic Records. I got Akashic Records reading. I did an Akashic Records chart. And then when you listen to them, I'm like, I don't know if that's what you really did after I'm listening to how you're explaining. This is a plane that people do not know much about since it can only be accessed in the glimpses of highly meditative work. And only, this is why I tell you, this path is highly meditative. It takes a lot of mental discipline and mental willpower to be able to get to this point, right? It takes with a considerable amount of experience, knowledge, and spiritual growth. There are also beings residing in this realm, but they are far scarcer than in the level below. The astral and typically more developed, strong and powerful, just like the sacred Ascetian temples. The Akashic records also have their own guardians and keepers. Royal servitors and also are able to reach this realm, being a major asset to anyone that wants a reliable insight into their long gone lives and also a very strong defense while roaming on the upper planes. This is why if you want to understand reincarnation, if you want to understand if you've been here before, this is why I tell people they need to discipline themselves in the spiritual practice because then you'll get the answer. Um, it's personal. You need to raise yourself up to the realization of it. Nobody can really tell you this because when anybody having the ability to access that part of you, they can't do it. Now, can they access impressions on the ethereal of that and and and? and Feed off of some understanding of it to a degree, yes. But don't mistake that for the Akashic. That's what real destiny is. Destiny is not something you are a slave to. Destiny is when you understand your own true purpose. Okay? Important to understand. All right. The last section, very short. Divine. The divine is the superior and most inaccessible of all the planes of existence. It is the all, the one, and the infinite. This is the root of realm. And it is complete understanding is beyond what the human mind can conceive in their material, physical mind. It is the first layer of the subtle reality, the one that enters deeply into the infinite realms of the duat and the land of the gods. No incarnated beings are allowed there, so no one can actually project into it. When beings like the Ascetians are capable of contacting a divine entity, it is the actual deity that passes to the inferior plane of the ethereal to allow that kind of connection to occur in here. So this kind of interaction is always dependent on their part. It can happen for a divine being, 
to go even further and into the astral plane, but that is something extremely rare. In the astral plane, it is more likely to be found a subtle entity trying to pass by a divine being than a true deity. The Ascetians hold very special ways to come in contact with the divine asset, but that sacred knowledge is not to be left out of the decadent of eyes of humankind, right? So that kind of covers, I wanted to go through those planes of existence. Uh, so you see it's more intricate that's passed on the surface. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to take a quick glass of water, step away for one quick second. Uh, I'm going to come back in about 30 seconds. So I'm going to go through the chat and your questions. So if you have, if you have some questions, comments, uh, type them in. And I will be right back. All right, so let's go ahead. I'm going to go to the top of the chat. I will try my best. Cannot guarantee I can get to all of your questions and comments. I will try my best based on time. So keep that in mind. Uh, but I'm, to be fair, for those um, that type their comments and questions in the beginning, I will go to the top of the chat and just go right in order. Okay? All right. So let's see what we got. Again, infernal blessings and greetings to all to get that out of the way. All right. Um, Bridget, everything is good here. Thank you for asking. All right, what else we got? Uh, right. um, this was a question earlier. The Dalius DX asks, while placing a curse, should I channel all my rage in a frenzy or should I be emotionless? Uh, in my opinion, you should never be emotionless. Um, remember, when you're doing work like that, your passion, your rage, and your anger, I always talk about using those emotions, which most on the surface would term as negative, but you can channel that aggression, that anger, that frenzy, passionately towards your magical work spell or curse. So I would never be emotionless. Um, I would definitely uh, channel that energy towards the working, most definitely. Okay. What else do we have? Uh, all right. So, all right. We just look like we might have some new people here from Southern Cal, Brian Gerard. I don't think I've seen you in here before. Infernal Blessings, Javon Michael. I think I've seen you in here before. Uh, from Santa Ana. All right. Well, got West Coast represent today. Oh, you guys got more fires burning there, right? Wow. Go on a beach. Okay, going to do some painting. Cool. All right. Patrick's music channel. I agree. Every time people talk about ancient Egypt, it's always about Ra or Matt, never about the black magic. Yes, most definitely. And, and again, I'm not, those things are okay. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's okay, but what I am saying, not that it's not okay, what I am saying is it's, it's always presented as if that's it. I personally think a lot of comedic, or Egyptian quote unquote conscious information that's out there is very religious in nature, the way it's presented. I think this path is beautiful because it, it, it really shows you uh, 
the aspects and the real deep inner meanings of uh, what we call Heka in ancient Egypt, uh, the various aspects of dark magic, alchemy, and sorcery. And as I said earlier in the beginning, the ancient Egyptians were the masters at, at it, right? These practices have their root and origins in ancient Egypt, regardless of what we call it today, black magic, left hand pad, whatever it is we call it. They have their origin and roots uh, in ancient Egypt. Um, Javon Michael says, either the first, these are the first videos to validate all of my studies. Thank you for making these. Well, you're welcome, Javon. If I can help you or anybody else to get your own personal understanding, not just mine, uh, beautiful thing. Uh, job accomplished, mission accomplished, as they say, right? Um, another comment here from Patrick's music channel says, the average sorcerer has been taught that they need to be protected from the energies, not work with these dark forces and utilize them for your benefit. Very few people are talking about that. Yes, and I, I think that might have been in relation to earlier when I was talking about banishing. Again, if you weren't here at that time and, and, and you missed it, we embrace all energy on this path. We don't do banishing. A dark sorcerer, a black magician, a black adept, whatever term you want. We're not ever trying to eliminate and get rid of any of these energies. We, uh, we make it our business to master, manipulate, and control all of them. And they're all vital when you have a thorough understanding of that. So we know they all have their root in the primal source of the primordial chaos where all things manifest. And whatever concept you need to understand that, you can go back to the understanding of Leviathan, where all prim primordial chaos emerges from. And we, 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 we understand and respect that. We don't accept the reality that there are external forces that we need to banish that can harm us or control us. Because as I said earlier, when you are banishing something, I always ask, well, why are you banishing? Well, I'm trying to remove the negative energy. Then I'm the next question, what's the negative energy? In your words, describe to me what you term as negative energy. You know the bad spirits. Well, describe to me what are bad spirits. I'm asking, and, and the reason why you keep asking is trying to get the individual to see this is something that they accepted as a reality in their mind. For those who are real practitioners on this path, we don't look at it like that. It's not a reality. We look at it as a great field of energy. It's our playground, and we have the ability to tap into it how we see fit and to make it happen how we need to see fit. That's how we do it. Okay? Uh, Juju Cake says, yes, yeah, still trying to learn all I can before I move on to that step. I think that was a really wise thing to say because so many people tell you to just start doing ritual work without learning about self. Yes, and that was to shadow work. You have to learn about yourself. Remember, know thyself and thou shalt know the gods. Everybody wants to work with these spirits and demons and archetypes and these different grimoires and paths. They want to work with all of this powerful energy and they don't even understand really the fullness or the totality of the consciousness of what these archetypes represent. And they haven't even done shadow work to understand themselves. So what do you think is going to happen? And you're not going to get, for the most part, a good outcome if you start dabbling in all that, but you haven't addressed yourself. You haven't addressed traumas that impact you. You haven't addressed your weaknesses. You haven't mastered certain things about yourself. Well, you just simply haven't gotten to know the real true you. And any good person that's on this path, any good teacher, any good person that's going to give you advice is going to tell you, know yourself. Do that deep shadow work you need to do to unlock who and what you really are. And until you do that, you're only scratching the surface, okay? Um, look, it is anybody's right. To, you can do whatever you want. You can approach and, 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 and do it how you see fit. But I can guarantee you, overall, you won't get the consistency that you're looking for. Okay? What else we got? Uh, Angelique Knight says, shadow work is truly never-ending. That is 100% correct. And as I said, everything really you do on this path, every ritual, every practice you carry out, has some shadow work in it. Why am I Because you should... Your work is geared to mastering yourself. I don't care what it is, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically, or financially. 
So really, in essence, everything you really do has some element or form of shadow work connected to it. You just got to look at it and you'll see. So it is never ending. Trust me, that is 100% true, right? Javon Michael says the entity summoned only appears and acts the way you allow it to act. That is true. But I feel that energy has to constantly be maintained. You do. All of this work. And, and that's part, really, that word is another word of saying politely consistency. You must be consistent in the work you do. I, maintenance or maintaining, right? I always liken it to a car. You have a car. If you don't do the maintenance on the car, the car is going to break down. You could have a high performance sports car. You don't rotate the tires. You don't change the oil. You don't, you don't do the things that are necessary done to keep it running at its prime capacity. It's going to eventually break down or not work. Well, you have to look at the same aspect. Look at yourself as this great machine that controls everything. But you need to do the maintenance on that machine. What is the maintenance? Your constant study, your research, your meditations, your spiritual work, your rituals. All those are the, are the, are the tools you use to keep this well-oiled machine growing, evolving, understanding, which leads to mastering yourself. So by all means, we must continue uh, to maintain. Very important. All right. All right. So Serpent Headed Mass says, I'm in recovery and doing step work. I realize that was my start in shadow work. Yes. Which has truly shown my true self and what I needed to transform and face in myself. The path has helped greatly. That's a great thing that you can connect it uh, to recovery. I don't know if you're talking about uh, addiction or, or drug recovery or you're talking about recovery from a, a, a illness, but either way, uh, it's a great way to apply that. It's a great understanding that you can use. Uh, and as you said, it's helped you in your path greatly. And that's, yeah, you're, you're right. In essence, um, it is a form of shadow work. It's a good way. I'm glad you were able to utilize it. All right, Kiona. Threadgill says, once being in the core of the fire through whatever situation, all control and everything you know is automatically altered and the old skin is scorned. See, you got me thinking about a pet and mastering your chaos and starts to peel off maybe slowly, but surely, yes. You basically describe the process, how they use in the story of set and a pet, right? A pet represents the chaos. When you master the chaos, the serpent is two representations the transformational change within you, but it also shows how even once you master chaos, chaos will resurrect and, and, and reform and, and you will have to deal with it again. We all are constantly mastering our own personal chaos. So we understand that relationship to self and to the chaotic things that we are dealing with that are in our universe, in our, in our realm, in our, uh, as the book describes, our inner realm, uh, all self-created. By how? The choices and the decisions we make. That's all karma is, people. Cause and effect. Don't spook it out. Don't make it religious. What's the cause? The decisions and the choices you make. What's the effect? The results from those decisions or choices. And sometimes in those results, we have to deal with self-created chaos. You, you just described basically how that works, right? We work ritualistically with that on this path through understanding the mysteries of the serpent energy, right? So a pep is not really a bad thing. It's just understanding how it functions within you, how that aspect of energy exists within. Because through the serpent or the kundalini, uh, there's, there's superior power in understanding how that energy works within. Um, but yes. Uh, Ish, Ishara Nocturnal says, when we see spirits... Are we actually on another, another plane of existence or is it only in our mind? It all, it all depends. In essence, it all has its point in origin in your mind. But remember, we were talking about the inner world or the inner plane, the astral, and then we were talking about the ethereal and the divine. <clears throat> on the ethereal and the divine, no, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be. Uh, it's in your mind in the sense that you have the ability to connect and tap into it because of, again, one, how you've disciplined yourself to understand those planes. Whereas everything on the inner and the astral most definitely is connected in our mind. But I want to make this clear. There is an external aspect to all of this. All essentially what the concept of all is mental, mental, all is universal, mental is trying to show you is 
it all has its point of origin in the mind because it all exists first on the subjective realm. So it does not mean if you're seeing a spirit, per se, as you describe, on another plane of existence, and the experience as, as, as you are experiencing is showing a manifestation of that spirit in some visual or physical form, you are experiencing it like that because that's the way the subconscious mind is communicating it to you in order for you to connect with it. So that's what I mean when I say, yes, there's still an external aspect, to it, right? But all is mental, mental is all. There is no above, there is no below, there is no within, there is no without. There's only within, okay? Because it all starts from within. So it's point of origin one has to have its root in your personal inner plane, right? Because there is where you start to master yourself to try to even get to those planes referred to as the uh, astral, ethereal, and fine, right? You have to understand your personal inner world or the, the various aspects of your subconscious or subjective realm in order for you to even to, to, to tap in to what they call the ethereal and the divine, right? Or even sometimes some forms of the astral. Because remember, as I said, we can sometimes confuse impressions from the inner world as being uh, confused as if we've connected to the astral. And then remember, the astral is only the doorway or the gateway to all of these realms. So I hope by now we understand what I've been saying for years. It's only the doorway. It's only the beginning. The astral is not the tell-all be-all. So um, that's the way you want to look at it if you're seeing spirits on another plane of existence. Through your work, you will be able to know in your understanding of how to perceive that, or what it is you're actually uh, perceiving. Did it come from the inner realm? Am I really seeing what I'm seeing, right? Um, and why am I seeing it the way I'm seeing it? If I'm seeing a physical body, a description, a face, Right? Because remember, connecting to spirits is not always visual. It could be a presence, a feeling. It could be tapping into a vibrational frequency where sometimes the spirit can mount or fully possess you. And then you now embody the spirit. That's a whole different level um, of connecting with a spirit, a demon, or an archetype. So it all depends on what's going on, the experience, and what's taking place. So there's a lot of dynamics to that, but it's a good question. Serpent-headed mass says the results in my shadow work have been life changing. That's a good thing. All right. Uh, the title from the book, again, if you were here late, a study in Bible. Uh, Louis Marquez. I'll put it right there, so I got to spell this shit. Take it down. I've uh, mentioned this book uh, several times over the last couple of years. Um, highly recommended to get into your spiritual library, even if you do not practice vampirism. You do not need to be a practicing vampire to read and study that book because, as I've said many times over the years, the book has so many spiritual concepts and information in there that apply to this path in general. I don't care if you practice vampirism or not. It's not a book solely exclusive. Now, if you are a practicing vampire, which, which I am, it is a very powerful book because, again, I, I only really affiliate and associate with the Egyptian or Kemetic path of spiritual vampirism. All right. Um, it's the only one I, I enjoy or resonate with. Now, I do read a lot of books and study a lot of books on vampirism uh, because there's a lot of, a lot of the information is just, it applies in general spiritually. Uh, I read a lot of Michelle Bellinger's books, uh, Father Sebastian, who I've had on the show as a guest uh, a couple of times. Um, definitely read uh, all of those books, but understand there are a lot of different perspectives of the spiritual path out there. Uh, so I would encourage you as a student and initiate. We're always a student in the sense that we're always seeking knowledge. I say that, not a follower, but we're always students because my definition of a student, I always consider myself a student because we're always trying to learn. We're always motivated to master ourselves, to study. Um, and believe me, you can never, ever have enough of information. It doesn't exist. All right, what else we got? Uh, okay, Javon Michael says, Paymon brought me here. Good energy. Okay, so we got your personal communication from Paymon. All right. Um, yeah, okay, you guys are having that conversation on the side. Let's get that. Uh, 
Yeah, that's a good good comment by Jill Gardens earlier. Archons. I like to say Archon, C O N, as you're being con deceived and bamboozled. I agree. It's just look, I'm not into that whole religious pre presentation of the demiurge and the archons. Oh, they they're they, you know, they can through the uh, the demiurge, they can uh, devour you and destroy you. Okay. Um that's a bunch of bullshit. Uh, Barik Velasquez, I see your question on Facebook. I'm going to get to that next if you're still here. Good question. I just saw it out the corner of my eye. So, yeah, I don't, I don't promote that. I don't teach that. I know there's a lot of teachers out there that do. I'm not knocking them, but I'm speaking from my own point of view and perspective. It's bullshit to me. I don't accept that as a reality. There are no archons that can devour and harm you unless you accept that as a personal reality then yes, you open yourself up to that. And not only do you open yourself up to that, you open yourself up to other spiritual attacks. So no, I don't promote that. I don't teach that. I never have, uh, and I never will, okay? I uh, see Mama Muerte, good to see you. Mama Muerte typed in, to those new to the channel, uh, Big Brother Brunetti is about the life and has called me out <laughs> on my shit. To this day, I felt and followed his guidance. If you're here, it is for a reason. Well, I appreciate that. Mama Morita, a.k.a. Mandy. Uh, yeah, me and Mandy go back a few years now, so I know her history, but I appreciate the compliment. Uh, thank you. Good to see you here. And tell uh, Big Papa Pump, a.k.a. Big Daddy Rock. Tell him I said what's up. Man. Matter of fact, I think I'm going to get him a call soon. I know he's probably busy as shit, but I'm going to give him a call. Uh, Sean D. says, have you ever read the autobiography of a yogi? Um... Which yogi? Uh, I mean, Yogi Rock Chahama. I'm familiar with his work, Science of Breath. Um, but have I actually read a detailed? I'd probably have to say no. Um, so maybe if you have, if you're saying that for a reason or a suggestion, maybe you can suggest one to possibly look into. I'm not sure if that's why you're saying it. But no, I have not, to my knowledge, read an entire autobiography of any specific yogi that I can read. Um, I've read a lot on, uh, what's the dude's name, too? He's a little controversial figure. Uh, Baba Sai, is it, is it Baba Sai? Yeah. Um, and I know he's a little controversial. I've read a lot about his life and history. Um, but other than that, no. What else we got? Juju Cake says, can, can one unknowingly do something like that as in hook into someone else's third eye and drain energy? I don't know if, I can't say that you, you would do it unknowingly, you would know, but can that be done to you unknowingly? Yes, most definitely. I, I'm not saying that that can't happen, but I can only speak from my research and experience. I don't think you would be able to do that. And even if it just happened randomly because maybe you're doing work, and you, you can certain high frequency of vibration, uh, you would at some point become aware that that is going on. Uh, and that's just from my experience. Um, I, I don't think, or I would not say that, that you would be doing that unknowingly. But reverse, I will say, can it happen to you unknowingly? Yes. Uh, hold on, I promise to get to this person's question and I forgot. Uh, where is it? Um... This was from, this is a question on Facebook. So let me answer this one. Can I upload sleep deals to program my subconscious to access these realms? Most definitely. Because remember, sigils just basically are sign or symbols that project certain aspects of consciousness. And they also can be used as doorways or gateways to spiritual or astral realms. So most definitely. Uh, there's simple path workings that a lot of people utilize on this path, such as taking one of those sigils, let's just say if you're going to work with Tiamat and say you want to uh, access Tiamat uh, through, through the subconscious uh, via your dream. Uh, there's simple ways where you would focus on the sigil before you were getting ready to lay down to sleep. Do it for a few minutes. Have the symbol of the sigil locked in your mind and lay down and keep focusing in your mind on the sigil until you fall asleep. That's the way you can activate sigils based on the way you describe it in that shape, form, or fashion. So most definitely you can. All right. Uh, I'm going to take another, one more question here on Facebook from Obadiah. When you experience something you feel is a spirit, what do you do next, if, if, 
if it happens randomly? Well, you would have to one next step is if you can't identify it, we want to identify it. So I would have to look at what it is I was doing when this experience happened. Was I doing specific work? Was the work geared towards something? Uh, then that would help me identify. Now, if it just, as you described, if it just happens randomly, I, I would try to trace my steps. What was I doing recently up until this point? I'm not just talking about moments before. It could be the last several days because something triggered it. Also, I would look at and analyze what's going on in my life. And is there something or is there a particular archetype and spirit that I experienced and connected with that would make sense? So you would have to do a couple of things. Uh, you definitely have to do your investigation. There's a reason why it happened. Now, we might use the term randomly, but nothing randomly happens. It happens for a reason. You might term it randomly because you're not able to identify where uh, being random. But in essence, it's not really random. All right. So it's not really random. It's just you're not aware of it. All right. What else we got? All right. Joe Garden says, when you work to deceive somebody and the deceiving works, you just stole their energy. That's true. If you're working that type of magic. Askia, shout out to Brother Askia. What's going on, brother? Brother Jack, Jay Jizzle. What's going on? All right, I'm going to skip that, this conversation between you guys. Okay, I'm going to skip that. All right, I got a couple more here. I don't think one was here at the end. Uh, Ishara Nocturnal, it says, when you initiate into the Klopathic spheres and you do not yet soul travel, you are still solidifying your magic and godhood on these planes of existence. Yes, because it's a process. It's, 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 it's a learning process. Um, you can experience the Klopathic when, when when, even when you're not initiated into it. Um, it is a different experience. Um, a lot of the work is self-initiation. So when you're activating these energies, in a sense, you are doing some level of self-initiation. There are rituals where you can completely initiate yourself into those mysteries. But as you describe, uh, you are. It is a process. You are still solidifying your magic and godhood on these planes of existence because the level of the extent to explore, as I said earlier, is, is not, it does not it does never end. You just continue. And a lot of the planes we talked about today in this video, it opens you up to that um, based on the consistency and how, how much you're doing this work. But that is a good point by Sean. Okay, what else we got? Skip, I found it. I don't think Raven's here in the chat. I know somebody had asked that. Brian, I'm, I don't see her here. I could be wrong. Okay, what else we got? Mystic Moons says, we actually are submerged in darkness as living on a planet in space. We forget that because of the sun. Only 5% of our universe is busy. That's correct. And when you look from... Uh, Look at this. When you look at a picture from outer space, our planet is always engulfed in darkness, right? Outer space is a, just another polite term for the void, right? So that's true. Um, we're always engulfed in darkness. Makes you wonder what, when who was writing that statement. In the beginning, God said, let there be light. The question that I always ask religious people, ask yourself, where? If we just say, I'm saying on their level, Ask them, where was this God looking at? Where, where, where was he viewing this from? What, what point of view through his eyes was he seeing this? They usually get lost with that, but it's a way to, to kind of look at it. Okay, what else we got? Uh, Javon Michael says, I like what you're saying about how the energy harness only reacts and manifests as what's already programmed about the energy in your subconscious mind. Correct. Amazing Nini, what's going on? Good to see you here. Got to reach out to you. It's been a minute. Hope everything is good. Um, Serpent Headed Mass uh, says, yes, recovery from drugs now. Okay. I've gone from homeless in the gutter to now just married and brought a house. Let me, let me, let me applaud you, brother. Your sister, I'm not sure I believe you, brother. I don't know. I think everybody should applaud. I got to applaud because I respect anybody that can go through shit like that and and as you say, uh, couldn't come out of it without a fearless, honest, and moral inventory of myself. 
man, I salute you. I give you a salute. Give you a round of applause. I suggest everybody put a thumbs up or whatever, some form of acknowledgement, because uh, I think that's a great achievement. And I like to hear shit like that because that's what this path is about. That's what this is about. Results. Uh, going through shit like that and, and emerging victorious. Um, so uh, I salute you and, and I'm great. It's great to hear stories like that. All right. Zacopak, can we choose to come again on earth after death? Yes. This is why when I was talking earlier about uh, the ethereal and the divine realm or where we access the Akashic, you will understand that. It's personal. Nobody can really tell you that. There's no book out there. There's no source. There's no specific uh, point of reference. You can validate that. The only way you can validate that is through your own spiritual work. Um, and that's why I was going through the planes. So as you continue to study and you discipline yourself and you start tapping into the many astral realms, which leads into the ethereal, onto the divine, um, you can access that information. Most definite. So, yes, you can. Um, but it's a very, very intense topic to discuss because if we're looking for some, again, source of validation, yes, there's many scholars that have talked about it. Uh, I'm sure there's many books and discussions out there on it. But again, that's great. But the only way you're going to confirm that and where it comes, it becomes a realization to you is through your own spiritual work. I don't care what anybody says. And I, I know there might be a difference of opinion to that. And that's cool. Um, but if I sat there for an example and explained to somebody, I know that that can happen. It's a reality. And it is to me. It's a truth. I learned that through my spiritual work, through the sciences that we just went through earlier. But if I sit there and say to somebody, accept that as, as truth and reality, and they have not experienced that yet, then what point is that? We're starting religion again. I'm asking you to believe something you have not confirmed as a reality yet. So that's how we have to look at stuff like that. I think the initiate or the adept, the skilled, disciplined, and consistent magician comes to those understandings of questions like that to get answers to questions like that. And that's a great thing. These, these are what I, I consider things that motivate us to be on this path. Of course, the mysteries of life and death are definitely one of them. Um, and it's a great question. And it's, it's, it's something I, uh, back in the day, would always ask myself, right? So through your work, you get that understanding, okay? Um, what else we got? Uh, uh, Mike's World asks, any tips on how to initiate astral vampirism? Uh, yes, I can. There's many. Simply, you can go into, for an example, uh, Vampire Sagu uh, Saguenacan by Father Sebastian. Uh, the best book I would tell you on that that shows you how to do that, um, The Vampire Codex by Michelle Bellinger. She's got some exercises and rituals to show you how to do that. Um, also, another good book, um, Second of Pep by Michael W. Ford. He shows you how to uh, work different techniques of astral feeding. Um, I would start with those three because I think they're good and they give you the foundational tools you need if that's a target you're interested in on how to work astral vampires, how to work with astral feeding. Um, and then also, obviously, this book. Now, I'll be honest with you, the Ascetian Bible is a little more complex. Not that it's too complicated, um, but there's sections in there on on what you basically just described. I would probably say the most easiest or simple one to grasp would be the second of Pep by Michael W. Ford, in my opinion. I'd probably start with that one. That's a very, he's got rituals and exercises on how to do that that I don't think are too complex. That's just my opinion. But look at all of them and see what you get out of it. You might, you might find something that, that uh, works with you better. Yes, and it, 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 it definitely shows you, uh, Mike's World, how to connect with a target. Again, I was, if you came on late, I was showing how that's done through the channel or the third eye, how it can be done spiritually by sending that, some call it a tendril or a force from your third eye into the other person's third eye. You can literally do this for, say, I've done this in a gym. You can find a target. I, I've mentioned this before over the past. If I need to get extra energy while I'm in the gym, I find the most active person in the gym. There's always that hyperactive dude. And you can target on something basic to just zap some energy for your personal benefit, or you can target somebody to, as it said, to regain their inner world, their 
minds and thoughts. Uh, so yes, it shows you the techniques, how to send the tendril out, how to send the points of attack, how to absorb the energy, but make sure you understand there's a discipline process because you can absorb and take in too much and it could drain you because you might not be ready for, it's just like eating too much food, you can get sick. So you got to also practice the, the, you know, the basic techniques first so you don't do that because you, you can, not only can you take from somebody's energy, but you could also drain yourself by intaking too much energy. So yes, uh, it does get into those techniques. Uh, Sean D, that question's kind of open and it's very vague. How do you manifest something? Uh, that, what are you talking about? Money, uh, something physical, something spiritual? It just depends on what we're talking about. Um, Askia says, when you just said we can never have enough knowledge, it doesn't exist. It just prompted in your writing for me to dissect, especially on this path, as related to knowledge and the infinite magic. True indeed. That's it. I'm going to write it to meditate. Awesome recovering story too, man. Send in love. True indeed. Shout out to uh, Serpent Headed Mask. That's what I like to hear. Stories of overcoming your obstacles, destroying and devouring your problems and issues. And not taking the role of victim. So again, I salute you. Okay. Uh, do you have to marry though? I'm not sure what that was. Maybe that was to somebody else. I'm not sure what that was. Uh, you welcome, serpent head and mask. You earned it, brother, sister. I'm not sure. I don't want to keep messing you up. I think you're a brother. I don't want to mess that up. I'm pretty sure you're a brother. If I'm wrong, please correct me. All right. So I get it right. All right. Um, what else we got? All right. uh, Dee Winley says, can you touch on the symbolism of the Queen of Sheba and Solomon? Why Solomon's kept connected to the greater and lesser keys? I right, remember the story of the greater and lesser keys. And I'll try to touch on this quick. Uh, all right, Serpent Head of Mass, appreciate that. Most people connect with the Goetia through the lesser keys of Solomon, which that's just the surface of it. A lot of the Goetias or the Lords of Darkness go, uh, these are beings that have their point of origin that go well beyond the time frame that is connected to the Lesser Keys of Solomon. Now remember, such beings as Bao, Bilal, someone mentioned Paimon earlier, they were all they all classified as Goetia or Lords of Darkness. Uh, Furkaz, um, I mean, the list goes on, Marcosius, uh, Marabas, I can name a bunch of them. These were all the beings that Solomon worked with. They say Solomon... In, in, in Islam, they talk about Solomon mastering the jinn. They talk about how he used these evil spirits, and religion classifies it as that, to get them to do his bidding. Uh, in some mystical writings, it says that they were the ones he commanded to build the great temple of Solomon. Okay? So, to your question, as far as uh, the Queen of Sheba and Solomon, why are they connected to the greater and lesser keys? Remember, the mythologies are replications of stories that came before it. You can liken Solomon and Queen Sheba to either Lucifer and Lilith or Samael and Love, whatever you want to call, because they're basically representing, when we look at the Klopathic tree, right, we have the divine or the demonic masculine and the demonic feminine. One represented by Samael slash Lucifer, the other represented by Lilith, because they are the facilitators of understanding these spirits and mastering them and using them in the light how we do on this path. Now, the lesser keys, in my opinion, is really has a lot of overtones to Hebrew mysticism and a lot of Kabbalistic information, which is okay. But I think to really understand it, if you go deeper into the Klippothic, it removes uh, a lot of the religion. Um, so there's different opinions. The connection of Sheba, that's just one. Um, I've seen several different viewpoints on it, but I can only explain it to you how I've worked with it in my understanding. But I would uh, suggest and to you and everybody else listening, you might want to explore that further. A good way to, there's a good book by Bal Cadden, uh, the uh, Citra Akra, working with the uh, demons, ghosts, and spirits of the Hebrew tradition. He touches on it uh, pretty good in there. He gets into that. Um, um, but this is why they can, you got to remember when you're reading these grimoires that came after the fact, they incorporated a lot of different mythologies and spiritual powers, um, in a modern day form that 
has gotten transitioned into what we call Western magic or Western traditions. So understand that. There's a lot of that stuff out there. Even when you look at the Necronomicon, working with the Necronomicon, Gnosis, that's the way Western magic practitioners took Sumerian or Babylonian magic and kind of came up with that system. Even when you trace it back to, because remember, that goes back to Lovecraft uh, mythology. And I would recommend, I haven't had a chance to watch, uh, what's his name, Jordan Peele's uh, series on HBO with the Lovecraft uh, mythologies. Uh, I keep trying to get myself to get around to watch it. I heard it's pretty interesting. Um, but yes, that's how I would look at it. But I would encourage you to go deeper with the Goetia or those demons or gens that Solomon works with in the Lesser Keys because they go back time-wise. There really isn't a time frame you could put on them. Um, even Baal, right? Some spell B-A-A-L, B-A-L, B-A-E-L. Baal is a deity mentioned in the Bible as a Canaanite fertility deity, right? That's how religious uh, scholars interpreted it when they put it in the Bible. We know that's not true when we go deeper and refer remember, any energy that's connected with Lucifer or the Luciferian energy predates all of this shit. There's no time frame on it. Lucifer is a being that existed before, in essence, I know it's going to sound fucked up, before existence existed itself. What we try to sometimes do as humans, and I'm speaking in general now, we try to put time frames, a beginning on ending on something so we can feel comfortable. And I think, in my opinion, it's just my opinion, I think a lot of people who came from comedic systems or conscious systems, Blacks, Latinos, whether they were into Egypt, Ifa, Santeria, or any of these pre previous cultures, I think they sometimes struggle on the left-hand path because they struggle to try to connect with some cultural Afrocentric identity. When all of it really has its origin in what we call the motherland, Egypt or Africa, uh, which is really the same thing, um, but we sometimes may not see the cultural identity and we may try to identify with that on a not realistic basis. So you got to get beyond all of that, all the, all those limitations, definitions, it's beyond that. And that's something I'm telling you coming from that comedic Santeria, that Ethan background, that's something I had to let go because it limits your understanding, right? Because sometimes we, we still need that sense to identify with something is that we feel comfortable with. So keep in mind, these things go back way before that, okay? All right. What else we got? All right, Mike's world. So do we have to clean the energy we take? And if so, how do we filter it? Yes, you do. Um, really, you recharge yourself after you do energy work like that. That's as simple as doing a kundalini meditation by taking the serpent at the base of the root chakra and doing an exercise where counterclockwise, you raise it up from the root to the crown chakra and remove whatever energy needs to be filtered out that you absorb. So yes, that's a very good question and a very good point. You do have to filter, uh, clean and recharge uh, the energy. So what you've ingested that's productive to you stays there. But what needs to be filtered out is filtered out through the kundalini. That can be a very intense experience. Sometimes it's not always pleasant, as I've described in the past. So, yes, good point. Okay. Uh, Brian Gerard says, I found your channel a month ago, and I love it. I watched all your videos on your channel. I'm so happy that I found you. How do you feel about masonry? Did you learn anything valuable? Uh, being a mason, still active membership-wise, I probably only visit the lodge two or three times a year. Um, I first came into masonry in the nineties, I'm going to say late nineties, somewhere in the late nineties, uh, going through all of the blue house degrees, which is an apprentice, uh, fellow craft master Mason, then going through the red house on both sides, Scottish and York, right. Going up to 32nd, uh, in the York, I'm sorry, in the Scottish. And then the York right to me was more, if they basically get you to the same point, but it deals more with his, Hebrew mysticism. I found the York Rite to be a little more religious, where the Scottish Rite tends to focus a little more on metaphysics, alchemy, and esotericism. Now, the lodge I came up with, I've talked about this in the past in previous videos. I was fortunate. Uh, one, I brought my brother-in-law in years back, and he recently just finished a term as master. Um, and the lodge I belonged to, I was fortunate because we had an esoterical society that met every Thursday. Uh, 
if you find a lodge that's good lodge in education and deals with metaphysics and a lot of the science of masonry, it can be a great experience. Not all lodges are like that. You can find a lodge with some fucked up old heads who are really religious. I've heard stories. I've visited lodges. I've been fortunate to visit lodges in America, in the Caribbean and other places. So I've got the, I've had the ability to see the different vibes at a lot of these lodges. Again, I was fortunate in my lodge because we had a good group, we still do, have a good group of guys that want to explore esotericism on a deeper level. And um, so a lot of it depends on the lodge you belong to. The degrees can be very powerful if you understand them. Even the first three degrees on the Blue House, they take on a different meaning to me now as I, my understanding of the occult over 20 years later. So it gives me a better understanding because there's a lot of hidden occult sciences in the Masonic degrees. Um, remember, you're blindfolded through all the degrees. You're using this eye. When you, it's, it's almost like there's a strange peacefulness in the blindfold in the darkness after you adjust to it. After the anxiety and some of the fear subsides, I actually became very comfortable being blindfolded and going through all my trials and challenges completely blind, not being able to see. Was it a challenge? Yes. But I think when you, after you go through your degrees, you usually get signed to a degree uh, instructor who takes on your class and a good lodge will take you through the degrees. And usually for those that all stay in your group, you usually stay with them through the entire degrees. And there's usually what they call Masonic education. Um, and it's a beautiful thing if you're in the correct lodge. So my experience was very positive. Um, I'm just not active be, as, as, as I used to be physically going uh, because of what I do now. Um, do I keep my membership active? Yes. Um, and I stay connected to a certain degree. So I think a lot of it just depends on what lodge you connect with. Now, Albert Pike, Morals and Dogma, which most people might have heard about, always gets a lot of negative things because of his background. And was he, was he a Confederate redneck? Yes, that history is there. But I don't even care about that shit because if you read some of his work in Morals and Dogma, which most people spook out and confuse, he connected Lucifer the light bearer to a lot of the mysteries of the lodge. And whether you like him or not, um, he was dropping a lot of science in there. Um, so it just depends on your perspective of masonry and what you got out of it. Uh, mine was a very positive experience. Debo89 says, do you have any interviews with Brother Panic? Yes, I've done several with him on my radio show that I don't do anymore. You can actually find it on TalkShoe.com. I believe Brother Panic has right now, if I'm not mistaken, I'm not sure if he still does anymore. I believe he has a podcast or talk show still on TalkShoe. I could be wrong. But if you go on to um, TalkShoe, I'm coming. I'm almost done. If you come on, go on to TalkShoe.com and type in Primordial Chaos, which used to be known as Awakening Universal Minds. Um, I believe we did three or four shows with Brother Panic. They were pretty good shows. Um, so I haven't done any shows with him since the radio show. Um, I haven't done anything here with him on YouTube. But yes, I did several shows with him uh, back during that time. Um, so yes, you can still access them on. Again, go on to TalkShoe dot com uh go into uh type in primordial chaos the radio show will come up you also see shows on there with dr delbert blair uh i had dr phil valentine on twice uh dr jewel pulcrum came on two times um brother out of detroit uh what's his name his name brother ali can't think of his first name drawing a blank uh had him on there I, i've had uh, a couple interesting guests on the, on the talk talks you back in the day. Um, so yeah, you can find them on there. So the answer to your question, uh, yes. Uh, and again, I think they go back around, I'm going to say somewhere 2000, between 2013 and 15, somewhere in that area. But if you go in the archives, you'll see. As a matter of fact, if you go on Panic's channel, you can actually see, he actually uploaded them to his channel too. You'll see it work Awakening Universal Minds. I don't know what he's got it titled as, but I know he's got it on there, I believe, from what somebody told me. All right, what else we got? Askia says, one thing I feel people need to know regarding Goetic Sigils, a lot of the uh, circles, triangles surrounding the actual seal of entity, the names of God, and for trapping the spirit to do your bidding. I heard, 
uh, S. Connolly, Goetia Magic Book. Yes, uh, S. Connolly has a good book on that too. Another good point. All right, I think I'm going to have to stop it here, people, because I have to wrap it up. I got family calling me. It's dinner time. And when the family gets hungry, they get mad. All right. Anyway, just a reminder, those tomorrow who are members of the Patreon page, we have the King Bilal ritual tomorrow, 3 o'clock to 6 o'clock. Check out the Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash Beniti. Um, I'm sure there's something on there you can find. Private classes, lectures, rituals, several different tiers. Uh, for those that are on tier 3, 4, and 5, I'll see you guys tomorrow on the King Bilal ritual. I'll be posting some new stuff. I have an upcoming class I'm going to be posting soon on Instagram that everybody's available if they want to sign up for. I appreciate those that uh, were in the class last week uh, that I did on the um, was it the clip off? I don't even remember what it was. Oh no, uh, the uh, Lucifer, the Dark Initiator. So I appreciate everybody that was in that class last Saturday. I can't remember. There's so much shit um, that I'm doing. Um, I will be posting another class that be for anybody available to sign up for. It'll be a private class open to all. Look for that coming in maybe today, tomorrow, or whenever I get to sometime over the weekend. Uh, again, thank everybody for the support. Uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. See you guys sometimes ne next week. Don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, hit the notification bell. If you need to reach out to me for a spiritual reading or a consultation, shoot me an email in the description box of the videos. Don't forget, first Friday of next month, Hip Hop and Occult Show on the Primordial Chaos Facebook page. Brother Ask Gear, I got to get with you and Brother uh, Taja. Uh, see what we want to talk about on that show. I got a couple ideas. Want to get you guys feedback. Um, I'm going to read out, reach out to Brother Set Typhoon, get him as our featured artist. Uh, if you got any music, send it. If you want to be featured on that show, if you got some, some hip hop, Music that's cult orientated for the most part, send it to me. Other than that, infernal blessings to all, and we'll talk soon.